So, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second day of the Japanese Avant Garde Experimental Film Festival 2021, Bodies. I'm the festival director, Joshua Smith, and tonight we have transformed Barbican Cinema 3 into our very own Pink Film Picture Palace. Um, it's so good to see so many bums on seats. Uh, we're marking the 50th anniversary of Nikatsu's Roman porno series with Tatsumi Kumashiro's Lovers Are Wet. Um, but before we see the film, um, just a housekeeping reminder, please scan uh, a QR code when you exit and fill out one of our feedback forms. Uh, it's really vital for us uh, for future editions of the festival. Um, I'd no now like to welcome uh, Jasper Sharp to the stage. Jasper is an author, filmmaker, curator, and independent scholar known for his work on Asian cinema and was the co-founder of the Japanese film website Midnight Eye. He is the author of the 2008 book Behind the Pink Curtain, The Complete History of Japanese Sex Cinema and is the co-director of The Creeping Garden, a documentary about plasmodial slime molds. Um, he is currently working as a disc producer at Arrow Films. Welcome, Jasper. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me. And all of you, thank you very much for coming. I want to say a well, massive thanks to Joshua and George for putting on this event, which I think, um, I think it's just very strange after so long being here in front of an audience. And thank you very much for coming, because even though we've had all these festivals online, I think the idea of like being here in person and... Uh, Creating a space to actually discuss the sort of films that we're watching, I think, is really important. Um, and believe me, discussing the film we're going to see, I think there's going to be lots of discussions after this film. Uh, it's an unusual choice, I think, for this festival. Um, it's an unusual Roman porno film. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to Roman porno. This was a, I don't know if I'd call it a genre, a branding introduced by Nikatsu Studios in 1971. Uh, Nikatsu being one of the four major studios in Japan in operation at the time, the oldest of the studios. It basically began film production as soon as film production began in Japan. Uh, so it had a history stretching back to, you know, early 20th century. Um, they, in 1971, Nikatsu switched almost wholesale its production to adult films. Uh, the Roman porno line, some people say it's short for romantic pornography. Others say it's like a sort of um, riff on this sort of idea of the Roman pornogra pornographique, so uh, the French erotic literary genre. So it was this idea of taking sexual subject matter and uh, giving it a bit of more of a sort of... Uh, higher cachet, a sort of uh, prestige that it didn't really have before. Now, I would hesitate to call Roman porno straightforward sex films at the beginning. Um, it was born out of uh, another area called pink cinema, which began in 1963. Um, the pink films were independently produced films. that generally, they were produced outside of the, the industry, uh, by fly-by-night film production companies that made adult film subject matter. But when I say adults, I'm talking... They, they sort of focused on amorality, scandalous stuff, taboo things like blackmail, drugs, prostitution, and increasingly throughout the 60s, lots more nudity and sex. Um, and... This was a time when um, television was really taking off in Japan and um, Japanese cinema was losing lots of audiences. And so the one thing that the, the filmmaker said we can do is we'll add more flesh. And um, where the independent uh, companies basically led, the major studios soon followed. I mean, it, unsurprisingly, because by the end of the 60s, a lot of the... Um, basically half of Japanese production had, had, was made up of these films that uh, were just basically very cheaply produced sort of skin flicks. Um, it's very difficult to talk about what sort of content uh, these films had at the time because a lot of these films were produced like on a matter of days, circulated on a single print around networks of specialist cinemas across Japan 
and then the prints wore out and they were junked. So only a, a handful of the stuff from the 60s survived. Now, when I wrote Behind the Pink Curtain, I always... I posited Roman Porno as a major studio co-opting this sort of subject matter and basically making it mainstream. Um, the more I've looked into it in over the past 10 years, the more I've become familiar with Nikatsu's own output over the 60s, I see it less as a continuation, a big budget sort of pink film, as more a sort of continuation of Nikatsu's own production practices um, where they used to make lots of youth movies and, and gangster movies and action movies, but they basically added more sex and, you know, it was the same production system, the same staff working on these. So there was a definite house style, which you didn't have with pink cinema. There was a relationship. Um, Roman Porno, between 1971 and when the line finished in 1988, they must have made about a thousand of these films. They were basically doing about five a month for like 20 years. Um, but they would circulate these things, uh, these films on triple bills, two of which would be produced by Nikatsu. There'd be one sort of slightly longer one, a shorter one. And the third bill would be like a commissioned pink film made specifically for Nikatsu cinemas. Um, when Nikatsu moved to Roman porno, uh, like I say, 71, basically all their contracted directors and actors basically just were left the company. I mean, some of them left voluntarily, others had their contract severed. This allowed for a new generation of directors to emerge. And so you suddenly had like this new generation of auteurs who working within the Roman porno um, genre within the field. Uh, of which Tatsumi Kumashiro is considered one of the most important. Um, I should point out that Japanese cinema in the early 70s had just... The, the Nikatsu and Toei were pretty much the only company that were continuing this sort of conveyor belt level of production. Everything else had slimmed down. There were a lot less films being made and generally higher budget. So this was like the last bastion of this idea of the program picture. Now, when I say... I mean, they had the, one of the things is that Nikatsu had its own chain of cinemas as well. So it would basically had a ready-made sort of exhibition uh, circuit for these films. Um, and also contracted out a lot of, had sort of contracted cinemas out in the sticks. And we see this in the film, in that this film is set, um, a lot of the action revolves around a sex cinema in a remote coastal town. And if you look at the posters on the back if you're keen-eyed and you know enough about the the sort of films that the cats were making at the time um you will recognize some of the posters or the titles you will also notice it the main character is driving around cycling around the town with a big banner on the back of his spike uh with words like inju meaning perverted beast uh on the back, and these are obviously all titles that had sort of um, were, were produced by Nakatsu at the time. So it's slightly self-referential in that uh, point. Um, the other important thing to remember is that uh, as soon as Nakatsu launched its line in 1971, about six months later, they got raided by the Metropolitan Police and uh, three of the films were prosecuted for obscenity. Not the films themselves, of course, the director. Uh, a film called Love Hunter was one of the main scapegoats. Also a number of Nikatsu staff and a number of Japan censorship body, um, Erin, were also hauled up in front of the, uh, the, uh, the courts. And Japanese, uh, th this sort of court case ended up stretching on for about eight years. So while Nakatsu was on the one hand being sort of a lot more cautious about the sort of stuff it was putting out into the uh, public forum, um, it was also sort of experimenting a lot with what you could get away within the context. Now, the Japanese censorship laws, uh, based on a piece of legislation for the 50s, the obscenity laws there, the main stipulation, it seems, uh, was that you couldn't show pubic hair, genitals, or sex itself. So anything else was okay. So what you could do was show sexual activity, but put a massive big black square on it. And so Kumashiro, as a director, uh, 
he made three films um, in 1973 that explicitly dealt with this this idea of censorship um, being well, it's like ridiculous. Let's face it. But this this idea that uh, you know you're selling a sex film, but you can't actually see the sex. So. Um, one of which, the first one was uh, called Wet Lust, Ichijo Sayuri's Wet Lust, which was about a, uh, a true life story of a stripper who'd, who'd been arrested for obscenity. And so it was a sort of fictionalized behind the scenes life of, of uh, what happened to her when she got arrested. And that ties into one of the strands of what Kumashiro did quite a lot. He did a lot of the behind the scenes sort of stories of sex workers. Um, the other one was Woods Are Wet, which was a very bizarre adaptation of the Marquis de Sade set in sort of Taisho era uh, Japan. Um, and uh, again, he, he uses these massive black squares. As soon as anything gets too heated, these, these huge squares sort of appear, obscuring the action. And this sort of ties in with the literary censorship in Japan, where, uh, because, you know, if you know Japanese grammar, you can basically all the verb endings and the articles and everything, you know, they're, they're all neutral characters. When you actually have the actual doing words, the verbs or the nouns, if you just block them out, then it's left to the imagination again. Oh, what's that say? And another one of the films he made, World of Geisha, was b um, also based on a, a censored uh, piece of literature from the uh, 1910s uh, by Kafu Nagai called The Four and a Half Mat Room. Um, and it was set in that sort of period of, of looking at life of geishas, but they, they, there are a lot of politics that uses a lot of um, newspaper footage to contextualize the time it was made and would refer to like stuff like the Russian Revolution by looking at the, um, the newspaper footage, but showing the actual f um, paper clippings at the time and how they'd been blanked out by the censors of the time. So it was drawing a, like a, a direct link between political censorship in the pre-war era on the 1910s and what was happening in the public sphere in the in the 1970s um i for this reason as a piece of erotica i i, I think like uh kumashiro's films really don't deliver what people might expect in in the context of uh what general nikatsu roman porno films were doing if you look at the roman porno films the titles alone will say it all. The very first Roman porno film was called Apartment Wife, and it was about a, a wife who's feeling bored because her husband's at work all the time, so she becomes a prostitute. That you had all these fantasy figures like uh, Office Lady's Diary, Nurse's Diary, all these standard erotic tropes. When I say I don't think of Nikatsu Roman porno as directly like uh, inheriting the mantle of the pink film, I think of a film like this, Lovers Are Wet, also known as Twisted Path of Love, um, it's one of its English language release titles over the years, uh, more in the tradition of the youth movies that, that were coming out in Japan at the sort of late 60s, the early 70s, in terms of how after you'd had all the student sort of um, radical left-wing activism of the of the 60s in Japan, a lot of which was referenced within the sort of underground cult countercultural films from the avant-garde, but also even there were pink filmmakers who, who would directly address sort of radical left-wing politics. That whole scene had sort of imploded. By the early 70s, there was no youth movement. So I think you get this idea of youths sort of adrift without any sort of purpose or sort of... Uh, Co cooperative, collaborative sort of sense of identity. And I think this is what um, Lovers Are Wet sort of addresses. I mean, it's a difficult film to work out what it's going to say. And I, like I'm saying, it's, it's, uh, it's one for discussion afterwards. I'm going to reference the old great um, first writer about Japanese cinema, Donald Ritchie, gave this sort of catch-all sort of... Um, description we said if you think about hollywood films are about plots if you think about european films are about character japanese films are about atmosphere and what i get is a very strong strong sense of the time with this film um and the context in which it was made and i think it's 
going to be interesting to see how it is taken by a modern audience. I think a lot of it is about alienation, discommunication, this whole idea of people going outside of social structures. The whole idea of, I don't even think of sex in this film as being portrayed as something pleasurable, but more desperate, and there in a couple of instances, uncomfortably violent um, as a way of people finding a way of just communicating, breaking down these sort of interpersonal boundaries. Um, I I don't know what else to say really actually but I mean uh I think what is interesting is that Kumashiro himself is always hailed as one of the great masters of Roman porno and I think in the sense that the field offered a lot of freedom for directors there was the edict as long as you delivered a 75 minute film on a certain low budget um and put the requisite amount of nudes or sex scenes in you know every reel or so you could pretty much do and say what you wanted with it and i think kumashiro had a very personal vision he did something very different within it i think one of the things that's interesting is that you have a male protagonist because a lot of the uh, Roman porno films in contrast to Nakatsu's action films of the 60s were very male centered but a lot of the Roman porno stuff had female protagonists that's not to say they were made for women or, or made by women or written by women but there was a definite shift in the perspective I think and, and the tone of the films um, and in terms of the aesthetic for the film uh, to differentiate itself from pink films, you have it, th all the pink films were low budget, so a lot of them were black and white, and then they gradually introduced part color formats. When Roman Porno started, it sold itself on being all color widescreen, and I, in that case, I just want to draw attention to the cinematography here. Uh, Shinsaku Himeda uh, was a uh, veteran at Nikatsu, and he made a lot of films with. Um, Shohei Imamura, the new wave director, which uh, one of the most famous being Insect Woman, um, set in the, the run up to the 1964 Olympics, which showed this woman's progress from country girl to uh, businesswoman through the backdrop with a big focus on the backdrop of Tokyo's urban reconstruction. And I think this film is very much about how people fitting into their landscape and how the landscape almost becomes a character in its own right and we have a lot of the sort of very long takes uh, that don't sort of alter space but they alter the cut up time a lot um, so it's sort of in that way it's quite similar to that sort of new wave aesthetic um, and I think it's a very interesting film lots to discuss uh, but like I say Perhaps not a typical Roman porno, uh, but, you know, when you have a thousand Roman porno titles to look through, what is typical? But anyway, please enjoy. <laughs> 